I like singing songs like that that proclaim uh, what we're here for and what we like. This is about Jesus. Has always been about Jesus. The first song that we sang this morning, when it says uh, he turns graves into gardens, turns bones into armies, he turns seas into highways, all of those are pictures from the scripture. And so when it says he turns graves into gardens, it's talking about the tomb that Jesus was buried in. And then three days later, Mary came into the garden and she saw the resurrected Jesus there outside the tomb. And then when it says he turns bones into armies, that's Ezekiel 37 when God raises up a vision for Ezekiel, these, these bones, and builds them into an army for Israel. And then uh, the last one, when it says he turns seas into highways, that's, that's Exodus uh, chapter 15, and uh, it's the parting of the Red Sea. And it's just, I, we sing these songs that, uh, even here I raise my Ebenezer comes from 1 Samuel, and it's, uh, it was a pillar of stones that was set up, and Ebenezer means rock of strength or rock of help. And they, they set up this pillar. They, the Israelites had chased away the Philistines, and they set up a, a stone, and they called it Ebenezer, which means rock of help. And they said, this far God has helped us. This far God has saved us, or this far God has delivered us. And a, a, lot, of Christians will, a lot of Christians will say something like, look, look, how, look how much God has helped us. Look at the things that God has done. Look at what God has accomplished in my life. And, and they'll call it an Ebenezer. Like, this is, let, let's have this as a reminder of, of what God has done. And so... We sing these songs that are all biblical in nature that have theology in them, and it's just, it's a lot of fun. Uh, but I, I wish that, like, there's a little part of me that wants to pause all the time and just make Michael stop and go, okay, now this one's coming from 1 Samuel 7, and hey, wait, this is coming from Ezekiel 37. That'd be really fun, but that would take a really long time, and Micah would hate me. So uh, turn to Galatians 1 today. We're going to be going through the book of Galatians as we finish up this series called Gospel 101. And today we're talking about the false gospel. We're talking about those things that are, that are false to Jesus. And if, we, if somebody came to you, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm assuming uh, about you that, that you in some form or fashion know who Jesus is. You have, many of you have put faith in Jesus. You have put your confidence in Jesus for salvation. Salvation is found in, in Christ for righteousness. Uh, and, and yet, so if somebody came to you and said, well, Jesus isn't God, you'd be like, man, that's a lie. That's a false gospel. If somebody came to you and said, Jesus wasn't raised from the dead. You'd be like, man, that's a lie. That's a false gospel. And there are things like that that are really easy for us to identify, but there is at least one false gospel that was all over the world at, in the first century that was difficult for the people to identify that I think is still present today. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit this morning. Um, here's what we have on tap. Those gospels that dilute the truth of Jesus are false gospels. Those gospels that dilute the truth of Jesus are false gospels. Our application today is this, reject everything that is false to Jesus. Reject everything that is false to Jesus. And our prayer today is, God, give us the true sense of the good news of Jesus. Uh, family focus, if you're wondering, how do we talk about this at home with our kids? We've used this one before, but it's super, super important. Jesus alone can save. That's how you talk to this, talk about these things with your kids. It's Jesus only. There is not salvation in anyone else in any other form or nature. Now, Paul is writing a letter to, this, to the region of Galatia, to a group of churches in this region called Galatia. And he is going to talk to them about a false gospel that they have begun to adopt. So pick up with me, if you would, in Galatians 1, verse 6, or listen along, follow along on your phone, your iPad, your desktop, if you brought that with you. I don't know. Whatever you have. Galatians 1, 6, Paul says, I am astonished that you're so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. So here, this is very key. A distortion of the gospel of Christ is another gospel. It's a false gospel. If somebody tries to distort the gospel message of Jesus or dilute it in some way, it is a false gospel. Verse 8, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. And that word accursed in verse 8 and verse 9 is a very strong word being condemned to hell. Verse 10, for am I now seeking the approval of man, or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. So first thing that he does after saying, hey, Galatians, how are you? Good to talk to you. Very first thing he does is go, man, I am shocked that you guys are turning away from Jesus. I am shocked that you are believing another gospel, even though there's not 
another gospel. He's like, you've turned away from the truth. And he goes, for there are people who have come among you and they want to distort the gospel of Christ. And he, the book of Galatians, I wish we had time to go through all six chapters this morning, but we just can't do that effectively. Come Wednesday night to Bible study or Tuesday afternoon here at the church for Bible study and we can talk about it more if you'd like. But this idea here is that Paul is offended that these people have turned to a different gospel, to, to something that is contrary to Jesus. And we're going to figure out what it, what it is that's contrary to Jesus here in just a second. But Paul gives us a clue in verse 10 when he says, am I still, am I seeking the approval of man or of God? Am I trying to please man? If I were trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. So there's something in this false gospel that is about pleasing man rather than pleasing God. And he goes, this is this is wrong. This is false. Jump over, if you would, to chapter 2, verse 1. We're going to walk through most of the chapters here of Galatians, but we can't hit every section. The next section of chapter 1, he's talking about, Paul is talking about uh, putting his faith in Christ. And, and really, this next section of chapter 2 should be part of chapter 1. It, it, the chapters were first added in the Bible in about the 1200s. That's about the first time that chapters existed in the scripture. Verses were first added into the Bible about 500 years ago. Uh, this is not part of the original writing. And, and so why they, while they are helpful in some regards, there are some things that are beneficial. Chapters and verses, I can tell you, go to Galatians chapter 1 instead of saying, roll up the scroll of Galatians and find this spot. Like, that would make it a little more difficult. Uh, we just come in and have a, a crate of scrolls for everybody. Like, today we'll be in Galatians. Just grab the Galatians scrolls, you know, and... That would be tedious, but there are some things that the chapters and verses have done to make the Bible more difficult. It's something that's a pet peeve of mine. Talk to me about it another day if you want to. But we're jumping into the middle of an idea here in chapter 2, verse 1, about Paul's faith in Christ and his journey as a pastor. And then in 2, 1, Paul says this, After 14 years, I went up to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I am proclaiming among the Gentiles in order to make sure that I was not running and had not run in vain. Let's pause there. If you write in your Bibles, and I highly encourage you to do so, all right, next to Galatians 2, 1 and 2, just out into the margin there, write Acts 15. Just write down Acts 15 in the margin. And then next to Acts 15, write Galatians 2, 1 and 2, because Paul in Galatians is referring to what happened in Acts 15. This is, and Acts 15 gives us more details of that story. So here's what has happened. Paul has moved to a city named Antioch, which is about 325 miles north of Jerusalem. It's outside of the nation of Israel. And Paul is living there, and he is preaching the gospel among Gentiles. Remember, in the Bible, there are two categories of people, Jews and Gentiles. If you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. I'm a Gentile. Probably all of you are Gentiles. Okay, And so Paul is preaching among the Gentiles, and he is preaching to them, put faith in Jesus for salvation. Put faith in Jesus for salvation. And what has happened is some, some people from Jerusalem have made their way north to Antioch, and they've come in, and this is what we see in Acts 15.1. They've come into Antioch, and they've said, oh, you believed in Christ? Great. But unless you were also circumcised according to the Jewish law, you can't be saved. In other words, what they were teaching is, it's great to put faith in Jesus, but it needs to be Jesus and circumcision or you can't be saved. Okay? And Paul was like, no, you're wrong. It's just Jesus. And so what ended up happening was, by the way, any gospel that says Jesus plus something else is a false gospel. If it's not Jesus alone, it's a false gospel. If they're trying to say that Jesus plus something else is the thing that saves you, it is wrong. Okay? And so Paul is hearing these guys say this. They're coming in and they're going, well, it's Jesus plus circumcision. And he's like, no, that's, ugh, man, that's not right. So Paul and Barnabas travel south to Jerusalem and they get to the apostles and they're like, look, we want to make sure that we're teaching the correct thing. We're teaching faith in the resurrected Savior. These guys came in and said, you got to be circumcised as well. And the apostles, and you can find this entire story in Acts 15, they have a meeting and they're talking about it. And they're like, should we make the Gentiles get circumcised? Should we make the Gentiles follow the Jewish law? And the conclusion they come to is this. No, they've put faith in Jesus and received the Holy Spirit. We put faith in Jesus and received the Holy Spirit. It's faith in Jesus. We will encourage them to not engage in sexual immorality. We will encourage them not to offer or not to eat meat that's been sacrificed to idols. But We'll encourage them to do that, but that's not a salvation thing. That's just, hey, you live in a pagan culture, and sometimes your culture does some wicked things, so avoid those things. And that was the message, okay? 
It's Jesus alone. And so Paul, when he says here in Galatians, let me read it again. After 14 years, I went up to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately to those who seemed influential, i.e. the apostles, the gospel that I had been proclaiming among the Gentiles in order to make sure I wasn't running or had run in vain. Even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Gentile. Yet because, and here it is, yet because of the false brothers secretly brought in who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus so that they would bring us again into slavery, to them we didn't even yield in submission for a single moment so that the truth of the gospel would be preserved for you. So here's what he says. There were some false teachers who were coming in among the church and they were going, oh, Jesus, yeah, you put faith in Jesus, great. Now do you know all the other secret things you're supposed to do? And I'm going to trivialize it for a moment just to kind of make the point. But they're like, here's the secret handshake. Here's the code word. We have a secret meeting. And, if you, like, and they're giving all these other things going, it's Jesus plus all this stuff. And he says, these false people who came in, and here, look at what he says, to spy out the freedom we have in Christ so that they could bring us again into slavery. So freedom and slavery is a concept that's going to be talked about more in Galatians. We as believers have freedom in Christ and the people who are trying to live according to the works of the law are under slavery. And they're trying to come in and go, yeah, yeah, great, you put faith in Jesus, but you got to get circumcised. Yeah, 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 great, you put faith in Jesus, but are you observing the Sabbath? Yeah, it's great that you did this, but are you making your offerings in the temple? And, and Paul calls that slavery, okay? And he says, we didn't, we didn't submit to them even for a moment. We didn't, we, didn't even, we didn't even submit to them for a moment. Why? So that the gospel, the message of Jesus, would be preserved. Now here's what's, what's key, and I need us to get this. This is what Paul calls another gospel that is deserving of con- condemnation into hell. If somebody comes into you and says, Jesus plus, that is a false gospel, according to Paul, deserving of condemnation to hell. And what's crazy is that... In, in Acts, in Galatians, in Romans, in Ephesians, in 2 Corinthians, the people of the first century weren't catching it because what the people, the false teachers, what they were coming in and doing, the first thing they were doing is, yeah, put faith in Jesus. So it sounded the same. The difference was, if you could compare the two preachers, Paul comes in and says, put faith in Jesus. The other guys come in and go, yeah, put faith in Jesus. And then Paul goes, and it's still about faith in Jesus. And the other guys go, now, what are you going to do about it? What's your job? And they made it about the work of the person. So keep going with me and jump down to chapter 2, verse 21, the very last verse of the chapter here. Paul says, I do not nullify the grace of God for if justification, and this is a side note for you, the word that is translated justification can be translated justification or righteousness. They are the same word in Greek. So if righteousness were through the works of the law, Christ died for no purpose. All right, here's the question that Paul's posing or a statement that Paul's making. If righteousness comes through works, then do we need Jesus? No. If righteousness comes through works, just work harder. Be better. Do more. Fix it. You weren't great yesterday. Be better today, and eventually you'll get it right. But he says, no, I'm not going to nullify God's grace by living according to the works of the law. I'm going to step into to God's grace through Jesus Christ and say that righteousness comes through Christ alone. Righteousness comes through Christ alone. And this is not a hard concept for people. At least it shouldn't be. Like, look, basic math, right? When you've learned numbers and you feel pretty confident in addition and subtraction in single digits, you know, you're like, man, I can do eight by four in my head all day long. You know, or eight minus four, easy. Pretty sure it's four. You know, like you like, feel that kind of confidence. Calculus might throw some of you, okay? It would certainly throw me. I took calculus in high school, took it in college. I never liked it, all right? I made it through both classes with a B in high school and a D in college, but like, golly, college calculus was not my friend. And then I switched my majors from engineering into art. I didn't need calculus too, so I took basic math like college algebra or whatever. Super easy for me. I could do that. I had just finished calculus. I felt like I could do basic math, right? Like you're like, man, some of... Look, here's my concept. Here's my point. The cross of Jesus Christ is supposed to be basic math. It's simple. I'm not, 
I'm not asking you, God's not asking you, Paul's not asking you to do mental calculus to understand Jesus. Have faith like a child. Jesus is God. He died on the cross for our sins. He was raised from the dead. He's coming back again. And everyone who puts faith in him for righteousness is saved. Basic math. Two plus two. That kind of stuff. Okay? But what people were doing is they were, they were adding in the calculus and going, yes, but have you made enough offerings? Have you prayed in the temple? Have you done the circumcision? And now you're having to keep track of all the other stuff. Oh man, I forgot to get my kids circumcised. You can't do that twice, right? And so once that's done, it's done. And then like, <laughs> I know, exactly. And those of you who don't get it, look up circumcision later. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and so it's, it's one of those things that like, they've made it harder. And what Paul's saying is like, no, man, it's, it's simple. Put your faith in Jesus. And what these other people are coming in is going, oh, you put your faith in Jesus? Great. Now, here's all the rules. Are you following them all? Are you doing the secret handshake? Are you going to the club meetings? That kind of stuff, right? So Paul says, I'm not going to nullify the grace of God. If righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Look at chapter 3, verse 1. And preachers can't get away with this anymore. Paul's just always calling people idiots and fools and whatever. Like, Paul just goes, you foolish Galatians. Can you imagine if I got up and said that to you, we'd be cut in half by next week, right? You, you foolish Tom Greenians and Erian Countyans, and I have to work on how to say that better because that didn't, that sounds clunky, you know, but, uh, oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you this. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or hearing by faith? There are two categories, works of the law, faith. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by works of the law or by faith? Works of the law, faith. How many categories? Two. Basic math, right? Okay. Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? So works of the law is done according to flesh. It's done according to our ability, our power, our strength. And... The Spirit comes by faith. Still two categories. The Spirit of God, righteousness of God, comes by faith. And then there's another category that's called the flesh and the works of the law. That means you're doing it by your own power. It is being done by the Spirit or the flesh of man and not by the Spirit of God. Everybody good? Flesh is not spirit. Spirit is not flesh. This is flesh, which is why 1 Corinthians 15 says flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of heaven. We have to be made differently. Okay, this is flesh, and what Ryan can do in the flesh is works of the law. What the Spirit does is only by faith. It's not, Ryan isn't doing it. Who's doing it? The Spirit, right? Everybody good? How many categories still? Two. Verse three again. Are you so foolish, having started by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Let me, let me explain to you what's being asked here. The Gentiles who put faith in Jesus, knew they received the Spirit by faith, and then they said, now I'll tap in and I'll take over. This is what it would sound like in a modern-day preaching kind of circumstance. Put your faith in Jesus so you can be saved, and here are the five things you need to be doing better in your life so that you can live out righteousness and holiness. Who did I just put the responsibility on at the end? Us. That's problematic. Because I can't do any righteousness on my own apart from the Holy Spirit. Because I can't glorify God on my own apart from the Spirit. What Paul will later say in Galatians 5 is, submit to the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. If you submit to the Spirit, if you, if you have been given life by the Spirit, he says, then walk by the Spirit. The aim here isn't that Ryan would do better or be better or do more. The aim here is that Ryan would let the Holy Spirit be the Holy Spirit. Let by faith, I put my trust in God for salvation, and now, by faith, I'm living today. That's what he, what he said three verses earlier, four verses earlier. I don't know. Four or five verses earlier in verse 20 of chapter 2. Five verses earlier. Sorry. Five verses earlier. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. The life that I now live in this body, in this flesh... I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Here, here's another way to say that. If you're a Christian, your faith in God didn't end the moment you put faith in him for salvation. It continues. And you continue to put faith in God to, to serve him tomorrow. You put your trust in God tomorrow. 
You, you want you want to have a better marriage tomorrow. You want to you want to you want to love your kids better, and you want to show them more the grace of Jesus Christ. It won't be about what you do. It'll be about you letting God work in you. And so it's by the Spirit. He goes on to say this in Galatians three four. Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does God, who supplies the Spirit to you and work miracles among you, do, by, do this by the works of the law or by hearing by faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Know then, it is those who are of faith that are sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. Therefore, it is those who are of faith that are blessed. Who are the blessed ones? The people of what? Faith. Not the people who are of the works of the law. Not the people who are preaching the circumcision and the Sabbath and all the Jewish traditions. It is the people who are preaching Christ that are the blessed ones. And and we have to be careful to do that. Look at chapter 4, verse 1. Paul says this. An heir, that's someone who inherits something, in case you're not following along and you thought I said heir or here or anyway. So I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different than a slave. Two categories here, a child and a slave. Though he is owner of everything, he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, when we were children, we were enslaved to the elemental principles of the world, the law. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we could be adopted as sons. And because you are sons, God sent his spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. You are no longer a slave, but a son. The slaves, he says, are those who seek to live under the law. You can't ever, the Bible tells us in Galatians and in James that if you break any part of the law, you break the whole thing. And if you want to uphold any part of the law, you have to do it perfectly. You have to do all of the law perfectly. Good luck. Good luck. The the Ten Commandments, one of them says to observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy. The Jews could not figure out what that meant. They kept debating and debating and debating what it meant to not work on the Sabbath until finally they came to the conclusion that carrying anything heavier than a dried fig was work. You pick up anything heavier than a dry fig and you're in violation of the Sabbath. That's a little bit ridiculous. Don't make yourself a sandwich that day. You know, can you leave it on the counter? And this, like, 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 it's stupid. And so you're going to be, every rule begets a rule. And then you're, ah, man, you picked up your kid. Oh, crud, I just violated the Sabbath. What do you, think about it, literally. The rule for the Jews eventually became you can't carry anything bigger than a dried fig. Those of you who have little ones, my boys don't let me pick them up anymore. You just look at them on the Sabbath and go, oh, hey, sorry, it's the Sabbath, kiddo. No. If you're a loving parent, what do you do? You pick them up, you hold them, you kiss them, right? Like, but that's a violation of the Sabbath according to the Jews. And you're like, well, that's dumb. Yeah, it's dumb. And this is why those who are under the law are in slavery, because you're second guessing every single thing that you do. Hey, how heavy was that loaf of bread that you moved from the counter to the table? Hey, this is what I grew up with. Don't you dare go out to eat after church on Sundays, because then you're making the other people work. You're violating the Sabbath. I heard preachers who would say stuff like, don't mow your lawn on the Sabbath and you can't do dishes on the Sabbath. That's what Saturday is for. Guys, that's not Jesus. That's the law. And if you submit yourself to the law, you are in slavery, Paul says. Tell me that doesn't just crush you a little bit when you have to, like when it's all about the rules instead of about Jesus. You are loved by God because of Jesus, not because he didn't mow the lawn on a Sunday, Right? So here's what we've got. We've got the spirit by faith, and that makes you a son. We've got the works of the law by our flesh, and that makes you a slave. Those are the two categories that are being shaped for us in Galatians. And then he's going to talk about this. He's going to talk about Abraham having two sons, and I'm running out of time, so I'm going to give you this story really quickly. Abraham in the Bible, who he just said was righteous through faith, we meet Abraham in Genesis 12. We'll follow Abraham until he dies in Genesis 25. He gets not quite 13 chapters, all right? Abraham, super important, gets this little section. There are 1,189 chapters. We'll round it up to 1,200. Okay, Abraham gets 1% of the Bible. Now you know. You feel better about it. You're confident. You have something to talk about at lunch when we go to baptism. Did you know Abraham gets 1% of the Bible? 
I like math. It doesn't matter to you, but now I'm thinking more about that. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Abraham, God comes to Abraham when Abraham's 75, and he says to him, he says, you're going to have a son through whom the whole world will be blessed. It's a promise of Jesus. So Abraham waits around for a few years, and he doesn't have a son. He and his wife are getting older, and he doesn't have a son, and he doesn't have a son, and his wife goes, I don't think we're going to have a son. He goes, I don't think we are either. And she goes, why don't you sleep with my servant? So he sleeps with Hagar, and they have a son. Whose decision was that? Abraham's. Works of the law, works of the flesh, his body. He's like, God, you made a promise to me that we were going to have a son. I get it now. What you meant is I needed to help out. Is that what God meant? No. So he's like, I got it from here, God. I get it. You made the promise, but your intent was for me to do it. Was that God's intent? No. But Abraham went and slept with his maidservant. Okay? And now he has a son named Ishmael. God says, Abraham, I'm going to give you a son through whom the whole world will be blessed. He goes, I got Ishmael. God goes, that's not the one I promised. I'm going to give you a son. And 14 years later, Isaac was born. And then Sarah sees Ishmael mocking Isaac because the son of the slave woman was mocking the son of the free woman, is what the Bible tells us. We'll see that in just a second. And so Sarah says, send Hagar and her son away. They do not get an inheritance with me and my son. And God tells Abraham, she's right, send them away. So he sends away Hagar and Ishmael, and he raises up Isaac as the son of promise. Isaac wasn't Abraham's design. That was God's design. Ishmael was Abraham's design. Do you see the difference? So the Bible tells us here in Galatians, we don't have time to read through it and walk through every single part of it, but Galatians chapter 4, verse 21 says that there are two covenants. There is the covenant of slavery, which is Mount Sinai. Moses, Moses in Exodus 18 and 19, 19 actually, went up on Mount Sinai and received the commandments of God, the law of God, and he came down and he told the people, here's the law of God, observe it. And he says, that mountain, Mount Sinai, is a slavery, is, is, is a law of slavery. Here's all the rules. Do them all right. Like, think about it like this. We go, yeah, but we're supposed to observe the Ten Commandments. Okay. Thou shall not kill. Any of you have somebody that you love that served in the military? Did you serve in the military? Were they ever in a position where they had to kill? And you go, well, yeah, yeah, that's not a breaking of the Ten Commandments. Based on what? See, here's the, here's the problem with the law. Somebody breaks into my house, can I kill them or can't I? Somebody's attacking my wife and my kids, can I put them to an end or can't I? I come up on a situation where three or four people are beating a man senseless, can I put a stop to it or not? I have a pastor acquaintance who has said if he comes into a situation like that, he will ask them kindly to stop and call the police to let them intervene. I, I, I won't be polite about it. I'm just not going to be. I'm going to put an end to it in the quickest way that I possibly can. And you go, well, in that case, you're breaking the Ten Commandments. Okay. But see, here's the problem with that, right? With Don't commit adultery. It's another one of the Ten Commandments. <laughs> I've shared this story before, but maybe not from the stage. My dad, with like the sixth or seventh affair he was having, my mom called him to the carpet on it. was like, are you having an affair with this woman? He goes, no, 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 honey, gosh, no, wouldn't do that again. He goes, we just go and have lunch together and make out a little bit. In his mind, that's not an affair. What's your opinion on that? Adultery or not? Adultery. But then somebody goes, yeah, but Matthew 5 says, if you looked at her, if you've looked at her with lust in your heart, it's adultery. So... We have to keep defining it and keep defining it and keep defining it and keep defining it, right? Or we say, live by the Spirit. If you live by the Spirit, guess what you won't be doing? Committing adultery, right? The law brings you under slavery because now you're second-guessing every single thing that you did. You stopped and talked to a friend of the opposite sex in H-E-B. Did I talk to them too long? Oh, my goodness. Wait, did I shake their hand? Did I touch their shoulder? Crud, I might be an adulterer now. I didn't even know. That's slavery. Do you see that? Or it's submit to the Spirit. Two categories. How many categories in Galatians? Basic math. Faith by the Spirit, right? Faith by the Spirit, Son. Or works according to our flesh, our ability, in slavery. Now you, brothers, look at verse 28, chapter 4. Now you, brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. Oh, by the way, so Sinai, the Ten Commandments, 
That, that, he says, is the son of slavery. Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven, that's the children of freedom. So you have children of freedom and children of, sla- of slavery. And he says this, verse 29, But just as at that time the one who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, so it is now also. Here's what he just said. Ishmael made fun of Isaac. Ishmael, who came according to Abraham's works, made fun of the one who came according to God's promise. That's, that happens. And here's how that works in 2023. Those of us who say, look, it's by faith in Jesus. My salvation started by faith in Jesus and it continues by faith in Jesus. We will be made fun of, the, made fun of by those who say, no, no, it's about Jesus and the works. They'll look at us and go, man, you're missing it. You're getting it wrong. They'll tease us. Somebody told Micah this week that somebody had sat down and had lunch with a, a member of our church, and this person told this church member who then told Micah, the guy was like, man, you guys are one of those freedom churches. You just believe you can do whatever you want to do. First of all, we believe that if you're truly following Christ, doing whatever you want to do will look like Jesus because the spirit in you is making you like Jesus. But here's the other thing, and I loved it. Micah said, okay, from now on, I'm going to start answering according to Galatians 4. Because Galatians 4 says that we who are in Christ are people of freedom, right? Remember back in Galatians uh, 2, he said, we didn't submit to those false teachers even for a moment because they were trying to spy out our freedom and bring us into slavery again, right? So from now on, if somebody comes to you and goes, you go to the 456, we hear it's one of those freedom churches. You can be, oh, I'm sorry, are you one of those slavery churches? (laughs) <laughs> because we, we are under Christ. It doesn't mean do whatever you want to do, run off into affairs and treat your kids and your spouse wickedly and hate the world. But here's the thing. If you submit to the Spirit, you won't be doing that anyway. But it isn't about what you can muster up. We have this American mindset, i got to pull myself up by my own bootstraps. Get over that in Christ. This is not about you pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps. This is about what God has done. And we started by the Spirit And we started by faith, and we continue by faith. And we go, man, I want a better marriage. What are the 15 things I need to have a better marriage? Here are the 15 things you need to have a better marriage. I will tell you the truth right now. It's actually not 15. It's only 14. But are you ready? The 14 things you need to do to have a better marriage, submit yourself to the Spirit, 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 and then do that nine more times. And guess what? You'll have a better marriage. Put your faith in the work of God in you, right? Chapter 5, verse 1. Oh, check this out. This is super scary. Verse 30, 430. What does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son. That's immediately Hagar and Ishmael. Cast out the slave woman and her son. For the son of the slave woman will not inherit with the son of the free woman. So, brothers, we are not children of the slave, but children of the free. What are we as Christians? We are children of what? Free. Free. And I need you to hear this. The slave woman and her son do not get the inheritance that the free woman and her son get. In other words, somebody who preaches Jesus and does not get the inheritance of God. That's what makes this so spooky, so scary. Because there are people who sound like they're talking about Jesus, but what they're saying is Jesus and. And if they're saying Jesus and, they do not receive the inheritance, which in this case is salvation. Because salvation comes by what means? Jesus only. Can you imagine? Can you, can you get that? That there are people in our world who are offended that we're saying Jesus only? That Jesus only is somehow offensive? Look, some of you are going to go, yeah, but Ryan, we need to be different. Yes, I agree. And I believe we will be different as we submit to the Spirit. It isn't Ryan who's different. It's not Ryan who tries harder. It's Ryan who serves God, and God works in me and in you. We'll end with this. Galatians 5.1 says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. People, talk, people quote that verse and use it in all sorts of ways. Here's the way that Paul means it, because this is how he used it all the way back in chapter 2. And he says this, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Therefore, do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. And back in chapter 2, he says the false brothers come in. They spy out the freedom we have in Christ so that they can bring us again into slavery. What's the freedom of Galatians? We have been set free from the works of the law for righteousness. The works of the law for righteousness are no longer a standard for the believer. 
No one could ever be righteous through the works of the law. We have been set free from that, and we are now people who belong to Christ. So do not submit to the yoke of slavery again, is what Paul says. Submit instead to the Spirit. Are you going to get everything right day one? No. But instead of trying harder tomorrow, what you do tomorrow is say, God, help me to submit to you. Paul says in Galatians 5, submit to the Spirit and you won't carry out the desires of the flesh. This isn't about you trying to do more or be more. This is about you putting faith in the one who saved you and can change you and can conform you into his likeness. It started by faith and it continues by faith. And when somebody comes to you and they try to sell you a gospel that says Jesus and, Galatians should pop into your head. And you should go, man, that is a false teaching. And you can't inherit what I'm going to inherit if you continue that way. Here's our application today, which you're surprised we haven't gotten to yet. Reject everything that is false to Jesus. Here's what that means. Reject everything that is false to Jesus. There you go. Anything that does not hold Christ as core, anything that does not make it about Jesus, reject it. Because Jesus is the source and the wellspring, not just of our salvation, but of our life, our righteousness, our holiness. And that brings us to our prayer today, which is this. God, give us the true sense of the good news of Jesus. God, give us the true sense of the good news of Jesus. Would you take a moment to pray that this morning? God, I do thank you that our righteousness is not a matter of what we've done. Not just our salvation, but our righteousness is not a matter of what we've done. Our holy life is not a matter of what we've done. But we who started by faith, we who started by putting confidence in you and your son and in the spirit, we continue in that. And today, Lord, we live lives that aim to glorify you by submitting to you by coming to the place where we remember, we remember that we have died with Christ and we've been raised to walk in newness of life. We remember now that we are controlled by the Spirit. We remember now that our righteousness is a matter of faith. And Lord, help us to be quick to identify any false teaching that would exalt works as equal to Christ. Lord, help us to, to take anything that would dilute the truth of Jesus, anything that would supersede Jesus and call it false. And let us be the kind of people who faithfully, confidently put all of our hope and all of our trust in Jesus, our Christ, our Savior, our Lord, and our God.